I just realized I didn't have my mic on. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to, at this point, ask Joe to go over the Zoom protocol for us. Uh, thank you, Chair Gossett. Uh, this meeting will be held in person and via Zoom for public participation. Uh, public comments may be made in person or remotely via Zoom, and interpretation will be available. Planning commissioners and staff will participate in person. During any public comment portions, attendee must use the raise their hand feature and will be called upon and unmuted when it's their turn to speak. If you're joining by phone, please use star nine to raise your hand and star six to mute and unmute. This meeting will also be streamed on channel 27 on Pacific Coast TV. Thank you. And Joe, could you take a roll call, please? Yes. Commissioner Ruddick? Here. Commissioner Hernandez? I am present. Commissioner Gorn? I'm here. Vice Chair Joannis? I'm here. And Chair Gossett? Present. Okay, all commissioners are present. Thank you. And also, um, with PCTV, I think the text at the bottom is in um, backwards or inverted, just so that you can, you're aware of that. Thank you. <laughs> and at this point, I would ask if um, anyone wants to talk about our draft minutes. Um, I, I don't know. There's, I think there's an error in the minutes. I don't know if anybody else caught it. Um, I think in the very bottom part, it, it um, didn't mirror exactly what the resolution said, so I was wanted to make sure that I am not seeing things incorrectly. In, in fact, I think uh, the resolution, um, as voted on, uh, that I signed and Steve signed for to send to um, the city council, I think we should use that language in the minutes. The, because what we voted on is in that resolution at the very bottom, at, towards the end. Is it the language about the downtown map on the balance? Yes, what we voted yes on and no on and such. I mean, it also says that we, uh, we had a motion to approve to recommend that the city council not place. I was like, wait, that's not, that's not right. English. And it was possibly consider, I think, was the language that you um, read into the record. Okay, so um, is, did staff understand the changes we could, were requesting? Could I, could, could um, we hear the first request? I wasn't sure it's at the bottom of the minutes, which section ex exactly we were speaking to. Yes, the motions, uh, both of the motions, we, we might, what we were suggesting is to go to the uh, resolution that we signed for that uh, hearing and include that language. For both motions, you'd yeah, like, the, 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 you would like the word possibly added into? Well, just maybe just copy what's in the resolution that we, you and I signed, Steve. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's more than the word possibly. Yeah, I think it. The, would you like us to? Would you like us to just reflect what we? We can play back the video and reflect exactly what the motion our, was said. Actually, we, we worked really hard on that resolution during the week, last week or two weeks ago. So I think it's the language in our resolution that we presented to City Council, is correct. I understand that. I just heard there was more to it than that. Yes, I think the motion. I don't have it up. If we could 
pull the minutes up, I don't have it in front of me. The very last section says that we voted to to approve sending something to the to the commission um, to the council, correct? But I think it's that's incorrect. The okay. motion to approve to recommend the city council not place the proposed measure on the November fifth. There was two motions. And the second motion was motion to recommend that the city council consider placing a measure. And I believe that's where you wanted the possibly entered into uh, somewhere possibly met, placing a measure. Or what, whatever was on the minutes, is, as Chair Gossett mentioned. But I didn't catch if there was any, any other change. So should, would we approve the minutes then at the next meeting? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. We are having a little issue just so you, you guys are aware of uh, getting the interpreters in. So that's what I'm working on right now just so that we have okay. the translation. Would, but would we you, can... Then we'll wait. How about if we wait until they sort that out? Before we introduce our item 1A? Yeah, please. Okay. It'll just be a moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joe. There's also public comment, Chair Gossett. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I'll wait for that, too, because... Um... I know I dialed in from Hong Kong once. So there's no theoretical reason? As long as it's accessible and has handicapped access, I think those are the two requirements. <laughs> you have to notice it. You do have to put a notice up. And it has to be three days in advance. You're kidding. Nope. Yeah, you, you, have you don't have to have three days at the location, but you have to have in the public the document oh, when it's posted. Okay. It has to say you're okay. going to be at... Um, the Shanghai JW Marriott. <laughs> That's probably 2 a.m., right? <laughs> <laughs> it was the other way around. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Which meeting is that for? Well, I'm going to be, Susan and I are going to be in.
Yes. Okay. Okay, so anyone who is want, wishes to participate from Zoom will need to re-log in um, in a f few moments. They need to reboot Zoom.
Um, so yes, we are having a little bit of technical difficulty uh, for adding our interpreters. So we don't have anybody that's here physically uh, that needs Spanish translation. So if we do have anybody that comes in and they need Spanish translation, we'll, we will have it available in real time. Um, in the meantime, we will go ahead and move forward. We're gonna allow Victor to go ahead and make a, a quick little announcement in Spanish that this will be uh, available at a later time for translation if necessary. And in the meantime, if somebody is here in person, we can translate in real time. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, apologies for all the technical uh, difficulties. Uh, les queremos dejar saber a las personas que estén mirando esta reunión por medio de Zoom que si pueden eh, alzar la mano si necesitan las traducciones y si hay alguien que a lo mejor venga en persona les podemos brindar lo que es la traducción en vivo y muchas gracias por su paciencia y buenas noches. At this point, I would like to open up the public hearing for anything that is not on the agenda. I see Sylvia has raised her hand. Sylvia, you have three yes. minutes. Uh, Go ahead whenever you're ready. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, hi, my name's, oh, the screen is doing something strange. Hold on. Okay, I guess I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, my name is Sylvia Tang and I live in Half Moon Bay. I've lived here for 25 years. And over that time, I've voiced my opinion and my concerns about the safety of getting on and off Highway 1. Um, Last September, I met with Deborah Penrose and separately with Maziar Bozorginia, the city engineer, to discuss the need for a signal at either Murata Road or Roosevelt um, to no avail. <laughs> um, this north end of Half Moon Bay has been ignored for years, and in spite of the daily congestion, it lacks any traffic control. The one existing merge lane um, is inadequate for the current traffic load. It's extremely difficult now, if not impossible, to make left turns onto the highway. You have to do a U-turn somewhere, or uh, drivers use opposing traffic lanes as suicide lanes, creating head-on collision situations. And then, of course, there's the commercial trucking from um, uh, Rocket Farms and the employees coming in and out. But with at least two fatalities in the in other injuries, um, sadly, most recently, a new one. Um, it's time for the city to finally take action and install a traffic signal at either Murata Road or Roosevelt Avenue. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. At this point, I will close the public hearing. public comment and then um, we will now move on to item 1a and the public hearing is still open for 1a and I, Mike I believe you're going to present for us thank you good evening chair and, and commissioners Mike Noche housing programs manager for the city uh, joining me this evening is Asher Cohn from the M group um, so he'll be a panelist on Zoom, um, and he'll be, he's uh, lucky enough to have him uh, phoning in remotely. Um, he just came back from some time off, so um, appreciate Asher being here this evening. Um, you'll be able to address both Asher and I when uh, it comes to clarifying questions as well as discussion items. Uh, so I do have a presentation uh, prepared for you uh, this evening. Uh, some of the items are gonna be refresher items. I think we're having technical difficulties with the presentation. We can't see the um, slides on our screen. And I don't know if the participants on Zoom can see.
again, <laughs> we apologize. We're, we're getting our tech guy to take a look at our stream but, beam that connects the two computers. I, so. I think, Chair, I think we can, Mike can continue because all this is an image. There's not an image of any information. Mike's given an introduction, so you could probably get to a point. Do you have enough to talk about or do you need to wait? I was going to jump into the next slide momentarily, so I prefer to give it a second. continue and on to the next slide uh, so uh, as I was mentioning some of the items that I'm gonna review are going to be background things that the Commission has seen before um, but for the public at large I just want to review some of the items um, so apologies for the redundancy uh, the housing element uh, itself uh, what I have on this slide here is a series of chapters and technical reports, essentially uh, appendices that make up the housing element. Uh, HCD, uh, you'll hear me refer to HCD, it is the California Department of Housing and Community Development. HCD has a very prescriptive process for all jurisdictions throughout the state. So every jurisdiction will follow this similar outline, so to speak. Uh, for housing elements. So there is a lot of consistency there. There is not a lot of room uh, within HCD's structure for flexibility. Um, it's something that we as staff have to work through some of those, just navigating those constraints of how HCD wants us to produce our housing element. Um, new chapters uh, this year is the AFFH, Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing. So that is a new chapter to the Cycle 6 housing element and a requirement by HCD. Uh, I think it's very pertinent to note um, that Half Moon Bay, as uh, all of the commission knows, is entirely within the coastal zone. The housing element uh, makes uh, a, a clear attempt to make connections to the local coastal land use plan. Uh, if the local coastal land use plan wasn't in place or wasn't updated just recently, uh, within the last four years, uh, the housing element in its current form truly would not be possible. Um, it, it, uh, we, we align with the LCLUP. Um, it, it essentially is our, is our roadmap to how development happens here, and the housing element is a plan for how that potentially comes about. And I'll get into more detail on that front. Um, that being said, a couple highlights regarding the LCLUP. It established a town center uh, that focuses development. It identified appropriate locations for upzoning, uh, many areas that were, were R2 being upzoned to R3. It created the workforce housing overlay, which did not exist prior to the LCLUP update. Um, and just to be more specific, the LCLUP was updated in 2020 and then certified by the Coastal Commission in 2021. Uh, it also cemented policy for affordable housing water connections, uh, which uh, the city has access to when affordable housing development comes through, and we work closely with the water district on how those allocations are, are provided to developers. That being said, uh, housing production uh, throughout, throughout the city, um, it's identified in, uh, in relation to the housing element is identified in, in three different categories. We have pipeline projects that 
have essentially uh, reached a certain part of uh, development, whether they've applied for Measure D application or they've received entitlements, um, they are at a certain point in the development process and they are listed in our, in our pipeline projects. Accessory dwelling units are also listed um, and then housing opportunity sites. Um, these projects that are listed there, some have moved forward um, to an extent uh, in recent, over the last year or so. Um, however, most housing opportunity sites are essentially locations where housing could go. It doesn't mean that we've necessarily received an application for housing to be developed on that site. So the regional housing needs allocation, uh, this is uh, often referred to as, in shorthand as RENA. Um, it's the city's regional fair share of housing. Um, it's derived through a, a regional process, as the name indicates, um, through the Association of Bay Area Governments. So the nine Bay Area counties receive an allocation of housing units that have to be produced from the state. And then ABAG, uh, which is the shorthand for Association of Bay Area Governments, uh, essentially takes a look at those and divvies them up amongst, uh, there, there is a, a long process that went on before housing element work started to reach what our RENA allocation would be. Um, and that involved input from all jurisdictions as well. Um, but through the ABAG process is how we arrived uh, or received our RENA allocation, which is 480 units. Uh, this year, which is different from previous cycles, it is much more heavily weighted toward low and lower income units. So 285 units, as you can see on this slide. And AMI means area median income. Um, I have a data point on a next slide, or a, in a few slides that I can kind of touch on what area median income is for San Mateo County, briefly. And if we need to go back to what these income categories are, I'm very happy to do so as well. Uh, the community outreach process started in 2021 for the housing element uh, with a series of city council listening sessions, followed by uh, joint city council planning commission meetings. Uh, we also had focus groups and stakeholder meetings as well. Um, so there's been a robust uh, outreach uh, that's gone on as part of the housing element process starting in 2021. Um, that being said, there is a chapter in the housing element related to community engagement that goes into vast detail on, on, on those specifics. Uh, as far as timeline, I, I want to acknowledge our most recent timeline on things. Uh, in May, in 20, May 2023, um, so over a year ago is when we released the first draft of the housing element. Um, HCD then had a 90-day review period, and they did take pretty much all 90 days. They, we received a response in late August of 2023. Um, from there, staff worked with HCD to provide an analysis of those responses. Um, there were a letter that we received, it is on our website, and posted. Um, there was follow-up with HCD as well as preparation for the revisions that you're seeing now. Um, I want to be, and you see it here in the slide, um, acknowledge that the timeline between May of 2023 to May of 2024 is a full year. Uh, it was much longer than staff expected. Um, there's many reasons for that, and I believe the commission's been informed of uh, many of the specifics there. Happy to answer questions on it, but just want to acknowledge that that timeline was much longer than expected. So, uh, the comments that we received uh, from HCD, they're provided in attachment three. There's roughly, I believe it's 34 if I'm not mistaken. Um, those are in attachment three. They're also posted on our website. And I also just wanted to reiterate that the if anyone's having trouble, it's a technically attachment one in the staff report, but the housing element itself, the revised version, is on our website. It's hmbcity.com forward slash housing element is our direct link to that web page, and staff keeps that updated. Uh, that being said, um, as I mentioned, there was a number of comments that HCD identified. Staff has selected um, a few, but we're open to discussion on all of the revisions. 
Um, I'm going to highlight a few of them that are in the staff report, um, and not to be redundant with what's in the staff report, but just to um, highlight a few of those for the public as well. Uh, minority populations, so this was related to fair housing, comment number five. Um, fair housing priority, HCD wanted us to do further analysis. Uh, what this pointed to is that minority populations are uh, disproportionately impacted by lower household incomes. Um, and this is the point where I mentioned about area median income. So for a family of four uh, in San Mateo County, if you're making under 156,000 per year, you are classified as low income. That is considerably higher than many jurisdictions in the state. It's one of the highest AMI um, categories for single. It's 109,000 per year. So six figures in San Mateo County due to the cost of living is considered low income. It is a common misconception. I share this information with many individuals, community members that I speak with um, that think they maybe wouldn't qualify for low income housing. Uh, if you're making under six figures, you would qualify most likely. So um, there's obviously additional details there and I'm summarizing, but uh, it's just something that whenever I have an opportunity to highlight it, I'd like to take the opportunity to do so. So that's why, partly why I included that um, here uh, for the public as well. Um, we also were asked to quantify data about overpayments. 58% um, of lower income households are overpaying for rent. Um, and I'll probably, we can circle back with Asher. I'm not sure if I, I'm potentially contradicting myself on whether it was rental or ownership would potentially be included in that. And I can look into that if we need clarification. It may just be all low in, lower income households on that, that point. Um, that being said, comment 12 was regarding revisions made to publicly owned sites. Um, I believe the commission is well versed on all three projects that are listed here. The Cabrillo Unified High School District is um, probably furthest back in the development process. Um, so we haven't received a recent update on that project. However, we have been, I think the last interaction I had with the school district is I went to a school district meeting to uh, provide information about housing development and answered a few questions and provided a presentation to the school district board. Um, and that was, I believe, the beginning of this year, if I'm not mistaken. So we've had some interaction there, but have not received a preliminary application. They did go to an AAC meeting. Um, I believe it was in 2023, um, but we have not seen a, an updated. They were making revisions, essentially. Um, I'm going to continue to move on here. So comment number 20, and this will be uh, very pertinent moving forward. And um, what I've mentioned in the staff report is that staff has released, uh, I believe Steve's made, made the commission aware, um, an RFP for proposals on analysis related to, uh, it was SB 423 that enacted SB 35 in the coastal zone. So previously we were exempt from SB 35 uh, it is a streamlining um, law that um, essentially uh, enforces uh, jurisdictions to uh, move through the review process in a quicker fashion, uh, ministerial review included in that uh, review. So essentially it would take, it is going to take effect January 1st, 2025. The RFP that's released by the city, um, I believe it closes August 1st, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that'll essentially provide, help us provide a roadmap of, of what's needed to comply with that state law. So it is a, it is a program now that's identified in the housing element as well. Um, comment 23 is regarded, regarding analysis of Measure D, uh, the Measure D growth measure. Um, I won't reiterate uh, recent events, but next steps for staff at this point is to uh, consider non-voter initiated paths to address the accessory dwelling unit. Um, ADUs are technically by state housing law prohibited. Uh, it prohibits regulations that inhibit ADU development um, through state law. So uh, I meant to kind of reiterate this on the coastal uh, zone and housing element uh, slide, but there's 
items like this where staff has to do our best to, to navigate both coastal zone law as well as housing element, housing laws, housing element laws that come up through the housing element, excuse me. Um, so this is one item where there is a potentially a pathway that staff will explore and uh, the commission will be a part of that. That being said, um, another uh, item that was a comment in HCD's letter, um, and I don't have a great wealth of knowledge on the, on the background on, on this specific one, but I know Asher will be able to, to fill in any blanks that come up, but any sites that were uh, reuse sites um, from previous housing elements, um, do you have a buy right, need to have buy right approval if they come in with a project that has 20% affordable units uh, included in the development? Uh, we have a, there's a three year window, um, which essentially takes us to the end of 2025 to pr pr prepare zoning amendments. Uh, staff also highlighted in the staff report the um, right next door to us uh, from the community center here is site opportunity site number three at Our Lady of the Pillar Church. It's the vacant property that's essentially on Church Street next to the church, uh, north of the church. Um, opportunity sites identify potential options. As I, I, as I mentioned earlier, we did receive a letter from the um, pastor asking us to remove that uh, development, or excuse me, the possibility of development there via the, the housing element. Um, staff provided some details in the staff report regarding our interpretation of why that site, we're recommending to leave that site just as an opportunity site. We haven't uh, necessarily received a, a proposal for a school, but I know that is of interest. Um, so that's part of the reason why that is uh, being there. Um, I should just mention, I'm kind of skipping over it in my slide, but opportunity sites are primarily focused in the town center. There are a few on the south end of town, but generally close to resources. Um, this site specifically uh, is one of the largest vacant sites in the heritage downtown, uh, which is another uh, part of staff's interpretation. It's one of the larger sites. Um, and if we were to remove it at this stage, uh, we received the letter in May of this year, um, 2024, when we released this revised draft. Um, so a lot of work has gone into some of the preparation of uh, our, as well as our environmental review. So removing it at this late stage is not recommended by staff. Um, however, we're happy to, to talk through that. Um, at the end of the day, the church still retains control of their site. They could still develop a school they could develop housing if they ever chose to in the future. It is just outlining that it is a vacant site and staff feels the responsibility to highlight that. Uh, I mentioned briefly uh, the environmental review. So the California Environmental Quality Act requires the city to embark on initial study regarding housing element sites um, and programs. Um, what are, we, we work with a consultant on this work um, and uh, it was uh, essentially um, studied and what the initial study indicated was that the city would need to prepare a mitigated negative declaration. So that work uh, has been ongoing, um, being refined throughout the, the process um, and it's pretty much ready for, for release. We just, partly why we wanna confirm interpretation on the church site. So if we were to remove that site, we would have to make changes to the M&D um, and there would be impacts there. Um, the release of the M&D would be released for 30 days. So there's a public review of 30 days on that document. Um, if what staff had planned was to release the M&D as soon as we um, submit this most uh, updated revised version to HCD and then the uh, this 30-day review period would also be um, started. So next steps, planning commission feedback on the two following, well, there's three here because we're open to feedback on just about it, on everything, but um, we had focused our staff report on revisions that HCD had asked us to be responsive to. Um, and then we're also asking for input on staff's interpretation of the Our Lady of the Pillar site. 
Um, and as I mentioned, we welcome input in other areas as well. Um, City Council is, is currently scheduled to review um, on August 7th as a special meeting. Um, we, we needed to set that date just to, um, City Council has busy schedules and it's summertime, so we needed to get something on the calendar. If there's concerns, please let us know as we go through the re review this evening. Um, we would uh, then, following City Council uh, review, and staff would be asking for direction from City Council to submit the revised draft to HCD, it would then start a 60-day review. So from here on out, any revised drafts that are sent to HCD, there will be a 60-day review. The 90-day review that I mentioned earlier was just for the first review of the first, or the first draft. Um, every revised version that is sent to HCD, they have a 60-day window. Um, lastly, I, I just, this is an acknowledgement. I didn't get into it in too much detail because I feel like we've briefed council and planning commission um, regarding interactions that staff have had with HCD. This is just an acknowledgement that we are out of compliance technically with our, our housing element. We're, we're late on submitting this to the state or at least having it certified by the state. So acknowledging where we are, we have had interaction. We were um, contacted by the state's accountability unit. Um, I didn't want to make that the focus of our staff report by any means. I wanted to uh, pro provide information to the commission and allow you to provide us feedback on, on what you might like to see included. So I didn't make that the focus, but I still wanted to acknowledge it and we're happy to answer questions about it. And just throwing up the housing element website as well as our direct email address. Um, we staff welcomes feedback um, throughout the process and moving forward even after we have a certified housing element. So I'll leave it at that and welcome questions. Okay, thank you. I, I believe before we go into questions, I'll open up um, public comment for this item. If anyone wishes to speak on this uh, presentation. Um, good evening, uh, Commissioners Gossett, uh, Joannes, Gorn, um, Hernandez, and Ruddock. I feel like I'm here with lots of friends, um, which is wonderful, and also um, staff too. Thank you. Um, so my first comment is, uh, as I was going through the document, I noticed a lot of opportunity sites that are around where I live, near the corner of Poplar and Main Street. Um, in fact, if all of the opportunity sites were to play out, there would be 103 units within a 0.3 mile radius of where I live. The concern is with the volume of, you know, potentially, you know, multiple 555 Kellys. But secondly, it reminds me of an era where I grew up in Melbourne, Australia, where this sort of concept of ghettos or projects where people of a certain type, for example, farm workers, school teachers, or um, are segregated by even race. So for example, we have a project 555 Kelly, which could potentially end up being a Mexican sort of enclave. And that strikes me as going back almost 80 years in time. In fact, it's what Palo Alto versus East Palo Alto was looking to abolish. And here we are recreating it potentially in Half Moon Bay. So that's a second concern. The third concern is I am so grateful for the work that this planning commission does. It concerns me greatly that we have a state law that requires us to, do, to build out rapidly. And I understand that the city must be caught between a rock and a hard place. But once a building goes up, and if it's not in fitting with the rest of the landscape, it's forever there. So I really hope that we can sort of, you know, um, that the public will allow um, the Planning Commission the opportunity to adequately and fully assess each of these opportunities as they arise. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any Zoom? Um participants that wish to speak out? No, that is all we have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll close public comment and ask um, Commissioner of any clarifying questions. Um, thanks. I, I had a couple of things I don't understand. Um, 
the so the five 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 Kelly um, counts toward the toward Rena. I I but I don't understand if because I've heard that Stone Pine for some reason doesn't count toward Rena, and that the school project might not count toward Rena. Um, I'm also um, at one point Jill was talking about uh, this transitional housing at Coast House um, that there was a possibility that some of those units could uh, qualify uh, for Arena, and I and that just kind of disappeared, and I wondered what happened to that. Um, and um, but mostly it's those manufactured homes out at Stone Pine. Um, and then I also don't understand, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into it, but I don't understand what happens if you remove the church site. I don't understand why that's a problem um, since the church obviously doesn't want to be included. Uh, that's so um, I think what might be helpful too, um, just for, for my process is uh, maybe just a couple questions at a time and then I can just, it'll help me. Not that I don't want to answer all of them, I promise I do. Um, so the first question was regarding what counts for the RENA. So any permanent housing site counts for RENA within city limits. So Stone Pine will count, 555 Kelly will count as well. They're within city limits, they are permanent. As far as the Coast House, the difficulty there is that it was temporary housing, not permanent housing units. I guess the, the question was, is at one point it was if they had a kitchen, they might qualify um, because people are there transitionally, but for an extended period of time, so. Right, and I have heard that spoken about. Um, however, my understanding what would be needed there is a, 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 de a that development specifically or that pro that would need to be redeveloped into permanent housing. Uh, so it be, would need to be converted. Right now they're um, temporary hotel rooms that were converted into supportive housing. They would need to, then need to be turned into apartments. And that's not to say that that's not possible. It, it is possible. So then the school would also qualify? The school, yes, yeah, yeah, within city limits, correct. And we're talking about all the units of all those places, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, the only okay. one that is not counted thus far is Coast House, which is temporary housing. Mm -hmm. And then the other question was, I don't know what understand, what happens if you remove the church site, I don't understand. Yeah, I might, um, so with we regards to, on it, so. well, I, I might ask Asher to uh, help me out on filling in the blanks on that, um, or, uh, winter as well in regards to implications with the uh, the ISMND, the mitigated negative declaration. So the mitigated de negative declaration, uh, it's pretty much ready to be released. If we adjust any sites, so HCD didn't have a problem with our sites on the first go around. Um, so over the last year, staff hasn't made almost any adjustments to any of our pipe, like the pipeline essentially changed uh, minusculely, I think it's within 10 to 20 units tops. Um, I believe that was related to the conversion that's going on at Zabala House. Um, so there was a, a slight change there, but that was caught very early on. That uh, re renovation, I believe, started eight months ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that being said, that was earlier on in the process. So the MND is, uh, pretty much ready to be released. That's why we wanted to confirm number of units. If we do that, it would just be a reevaluation. I can look to Asher to fill in blanks that maybe I'm not covering in the best detail, but okay. that's the summary that, version. That's pretty clear. I guess the, so the flip side of that is if we keep it in there, um, how, I don't understand how that's really detrimental to the church. I know they don't want development on that property, but, but, it, but it doesn't hurt them. Exactly. Correct. Staff agrees, and at our the church has it's their property. They re retain ownership rights over that land. They they can develop it however they see fit. The first 
There were two letters, just to be overly transparent. It's included in the um, public uh, comments. We received two letters from the church, one back in 2021 um, that I can't speak to necessarily, um, that indicated the church wanted to develop a school on that site three years ago. We haven't received an application to build a school in the last three years, so therefore it's still an opportunity site. Not to say that a, a hybrid approach couldn't be taken as well for housing and a school. I have heard that's not of interest, but it could happen if someone wanted to. Thank you. Commissioner Roddick, do you have clarifying questions? Well, I, I just have one, Mike, and thank you for this presentation. <clears throat> this question is just out of my own curiosity. Do, do you know if the RENA target for unincorporated San Mateo County is one number, or is it more granular than that? Does El Granada get a number and Monterra get a number? That's a good question, <laughs> and I may have looked at it a couple of years ago, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't know offhand. Um, I think the county divides it up, uh, like just in their own kind of workflow internally. I believe it's, you know, they only have, you know, the housing element is only effective to their unincorporated areas of the county. So I believe they do break up their arena on goals amongst those regions, but I think it's done internally through a county process, not necessarily by the state. Yeah, I don't blame you for not knowing that off the top of your head, but it's a... It's a great question. In, in theory, it would, you know, it, in the long run, could impact the coast side and Half Moon Bay a little bit. It would be interesting to know. Commissioner Hernandez. Going back to um, the question of the church site, um, two, two questions, I guess. Um, if this remains a potential site for housing um, in the plan, does that give, does this document confer any special privileges or rights to the city? Does it give us the ability to use something like eminent domain to seize the property at market value? And does it give us any special benefit or create any kind of disadvantage to the church by not, its inclusion? Not through the housing element. All, all land use as far as how a property can be used is essentially uh, dictated by the land use plan. So. Our guiding document when creating the housing element is the land use plan. So uh, the workforce housing overlay is probably the biggest impact to sites such as the church as well as any other publicly owned site. It's why the school district is entertaining uh, workforce housing on their site. It's why 555 Kelly was uh, potentially able to move forward was the workforce housing overlay, which is uh, part of the land use plan. So the, the follow-up question I have is um, if the owner of the property says, we ain't using this for this purpose, um, and I've heard um, representatives of the church who are working on the school say, we're not planning on putting housing here at this time. Um, just under state law, and I look at the header, I think it's um, reasonable candidates or, or there's some kind of language, I can't remember the specific language that we use, but there's an expectation that this is developable, developable as affordable housing or as, as housing stock. Um, do we have an obligation to say, you know what, the owner is taking this off the table, so we, under state law, should remove it? That's question number two. And then question number three, if we're reducing the number of units of housing um, in the mitigated negative deck, how does it adversely affect the deck? It just seems like we've got a document that's, unless there's some mitigation that needs to pl take place, um, it seems like there's probably no negative impact by removing housing stock. And maybe that's a question for your colleague, um, that's like that last one. So. Yeah, I might ask Winter and, and Asher to help me out on that response. As far as the um, your first question, um, the housing element itself is an eight-year cycle. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's not recommended to, for at least for opportunity sites, ownership could change or um, administrators can change when it comes to publicly owned sites. So plans for sites can change as well. I'm not saying I know that information or that that has been indicated to us. I'm just saying it's the responsibility of the city to identify sites when they're vacant within the city center. It is that much more of a cause and being this is the largest one within the city mm -hmm. center that has not been developed. It raises a flag on why, why is the city not indicating that housing could go here from an HD, HCD perspective. So that's a decision, policy decision from the city through the commission and, and city council to staff if that is something we don't want to include. Okay. Uh, but that, it is an eight year cycle. That's perfectly reasonable and is, is the approach we've taken consistent with what the county does or other jurisdiction was within the county do? Yeah, there was an instance recently in Monterey where the city chose to leave a site as an opportunity site even though the, I believe it was the owner, I think it was the school district, uh, there was some opposition to housing going on that site but decided to leave it in because it, it could produce housing on that site. and. That is probably the connection to the ISMND is the fact that it could produce housing and that it should be studied okay. because it can produce housing. I don't know if there's more to add, if Asher or Winner want to add to that on legal requirements from a CEQA perspective. I'm not a CEQA expert, but I'm happy to get feedback if I missed anything. Thank you. Hi. Hey. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it is perfectly acceptable to have an environmental document that analyzes greater impacts than the actual project that's selected. So I don't think that would be a flaw in the MND if the MND analyzed um, additional units that then were not um, actually included in the housing element. So I don't think that would be a sequel violation. We do try and provide as accurate of information as we can in these documents. It's an informational document. So um, I think this is why um, there was some interest in nailing down what the sites were so that, you know, the, the MND could be as informative as possible. I have no further questions at this time. Um, I do have, I have several questions but since we're talking about this, the church site. So if, if, if it doesn't matter whether or not this is in the element and the only reason why the site is in the element is because of the IMD, right? Um, and it's, it, it's difficult now to remove it because it's, um, it won't be studied. But if they were to come back, the, the, if, if this were to be removed, and the church were to come back and say, hey, we want to put housing in it, there would be a separate CEQA process for that, unless it was you know, the bonus density. So I don't see why we couldn't remove it if that's what they choose to remove. Um, because I'm reading the letters that they sent in and they, they pretty much said that since 2021, they've said that they did not want to be included in the site. And so, if they're going to go through a CEQA process anyway, why not remove them now, make them happy, and move forward? Because it seems to me that we're, the only reason why we're putting all these opportunity sites in the process is so that we can appease HCD so they can check off a site and say, oh, we looked at this. And it almost seems disingenuous to put every site, I mean, really, I have vacant land in my backyard. You should be putting my, my uh, lot in there too. So why is it that we're not going across the t city on every single piece of vacant land and putting it on there. It just seems to me that we're just checking a off a box to make HCD happy and it's meaningless in the end. So if, if we're to remove this, it would, it seems to me it wouldn't make any difference. I could respond uh, yes. and help with can I just, some information and can background. Can I just follow up on that with one other point? Do we have a requirement to have a, a certain amount of buffer in I the plan? My, my, that's where I was going to go. You beat me to it. I was going to ask Asher if he could provide, um, and we'll make sure Asher's uh, mic capabilities were all hooked up. I know we've been having technical difficulties. I know he's a panelist, so he should be able to unmute and respond. But Asher, if you could uh, just speak to the buffer that uh, Commissioner Hernandez was alluding to, um, that'd be appreciated. It is a requirement of the city that we have to go beyond our uh, 480 units because 
uh, at the end of the day, sites that we identify will not get developed during this cycle. Um, and that is just a realistic response that HCD is requiring all cities. Um, I'll need Asher to refresh us on what the buffer um, is and how close we would get to that. There'd be additional calculations. That was all taken into account when we, when we were producing the list of, of potential sites. I think the thing I'll add before I let Asher jump in is um, staff has to do uh, you know, analysis of all of our sites throughout the city. Um, sites on the outskirts of town or that are vacant um, may have environmental concerns or be um, overlap with wetlands. So um, they might visibly be vacant. Um, however, they may not be well suited for housing. Um, we also look at who owns the land. If it is a public, uh, public or uh, privately owned, um, and how that, you know, what is next to it, if it has any environmental constraints. So there's a few um, items that that are evaluated during that process. Um, Asher, if you could speak to the the buffer, that would be appreciated. Sure. Thank you, Mike. Uh, can everybody hear me? Can the commissioners hear me? I just want to confirm that before I begin. We can hear you. Thanks, Asher. Great. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, thank you. And good evening, everybody. I'm Asher Cohen, I'm a planner with M Group. I've been helping out Half Moon Bay city staff uh, throughout this document. So as, uh, as Mike alluded to, I guess I think the first thing to consider is that HC is looking at the technical, um, making sure there's no environmental, physical constraints on the land. Um, that's their primary concern. Throughout the county, they've accepted sites, including sites owned by religious groups that the current pastor may not have interest in developing. So this is fairly common throughout the county, and HCD's uh, been very interested in these sites developing. And um, there's lots of laws that are coming through, um, some that are currently in Sacramento trying to incentivize residential development on um, sites owned by religious facilities. In terms of the buffer, um, as Mike was saying, yeah, uh, there needs to be, it's important to have flexibility in terms of how many sites are available in the site inventory in order to give the city flexibility because uh, as we discussed, plants change. Um, so that might look like a really great site now, might not work out for some unforeseeable reason. Um, you know, things can happen. So there's um, there's a no net loss law, which one of the things that it indicates that there must be um, sufficient adequate sites throughout the planning period, throughout the year planning period to meet each income category. So this basically means that there needs to be, um, this is where the bad idea of the buffer comes in. There needs to be flexibility in case um, a site gets developed with a non-residential use or something happens that makes the site fall off. Um, it's really important from HCD's perspective, from the state's perspective to have that flexibility. And the buffer then is uh, where we get that. So there is in the HCD guidebook when it comes to sites inventory, uh, this is something that came out in 2020. So uh, May 2020, a little bit more than four years ago, they recommend a buffer of at least 15 to 30% specifically or especially, I should say, for lower income categories. So what this uh, particular site allows us is to have that flexibility throughout the planning period. Um, as you said, we plans change and we, um, as another commissioner mentioned it, we respect the intention and designs of the um, site owners. And the, this is a great site, you know, having a site in the downtown area um, there's no physical constraints. There's a lot of things that HCD looks at it very, um, it looks really great from their perspective. And um, having it be retained in the site inventory allows us to uh, have a lot of flexibility throughout the planning period as you go through the next several years. I do have a follow-up question. My understanding yes. is, uh, it, so I understand what HED is doing and I understand the flexibility. Uh, I still have concern over putting sites on that the, the owners don't want to have on, right? So we have to find another, if this is supposed to be a buffer, we probably should find another buffer site somewhere, figure out how to do it. I, I, you know, in, in, and I'm not suggesting you figure it, I'm just saying we all need to figure out how to do it. 
Um, I understand that, and, and this might be addressed later, um, these housing sites are tied into also what we con considered constraints through the Measure D. And, and I'm understanding that there's, we have to really look at how those Measure D allocations are done to figure out whether this, these, the number of units that this potential site will have, and I don't remember, how many units did, we, did uh, the city say? For the, for the, for church, the church, yeah. It's 40 to 50. 40 to 50 over, and we're looking at it over the period of eight, is it eight years? Right. And okay, so, yeah. so then we have Measure D allocations that need to be looked at because there's, possi there's flexibility there too. So we need to, be, we need to balance that out. Um, I understand too that this particular site um, has been, t has been um, targeted by the church uh, since 2003 as it being a school site. They had plans that they had already done. And I understand that they are submitting, um, oh, they have submitted a plan or use permit, because they already have a use permit as a church and it's an educational facility, and the city has somehow decided that it's not applicable. So if they, ha so the intent is already there. And to just, because it doesn't have plans, we know it's a very solid intent. And I'm wondering why it is that we have to have the site in if they don't want to be, have it in. And they're actively working on this, from what I understand. My understanding is that they've been on this since 2003. I can confirm that there's a, a, a school organization that's renting a facility at the church. Um, my understanding, it's a private organization. Um, they may, I'm sure they have support from the church to be running that, that school. Um, I don't believe it's a K through eight school that is part of the archdiocese necessarily. My understanding is they're renting the space from the school and they did need a use permit. I, I believe that is accurate. I don't have the information offhand, but I can confirm that that is, is the case. Um, well before I worked here, I know there were plans that were going on for that site. So. I can speak to what we've received since. I, well, John's been here longer than I have, so I'll, I'll let you chime I'm, in. I'm not even gonna, if I could, do the, the chair. I, I, all I'm gonna say is, um, is this from a historical perspective, um, they've been working on something. It's unclear what they've been working on exactly and where they go and what's going on. We don't wanna step in the way of that if that's what they wanna do and that's what their vision is, fine. What I'm, going to say is the city council, many city, many city council members, and I, I would say majority of our council have identified that site as one that they are interested in and have been working with privately and publicly to try to get the archdiocese and the church to change their attitude and minds and look at a hybrid, look at a mixed use project to that point. This is here in part because the city council has identified this and, and has looked at this. I literally, I, I went on a, on a tour with Anna Eshu and, and, uh, and other staff and the county and other parties on this deal. So this is not a small issue, but in the end, you make your recommendation, the council will decide what they wanna do. And um, you know, it provides us a nice buffer. It is an absolutely wonderful site close to town, close to services, all the things that you would look at as an opportunity site. So, but that's a policy choice. That's a choice that you make as the commission. And, and um, you know, if, if you feel that strongly, um, make your recommendation and, and, and roll with it. I don't think we have to belabor that conversation too long here. It's just, you know, you asked for our thoughts, but I wanted to put some well, context I, 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 to the larger piece. Excuse of the me, councils. I just wanted to say that yeah. we didn't bring this site up here. It was in, in, it was sure. placed in the agenda item. Had it not been placed in the agenda item, it most likely wouldn't have been brought up. So it, it is. We're not. I'm not trying to belabor it. I'm just trying to understand it, and I really would like to understand exactly what impacts it has on the city and on the um, the. Um, church and on whether it is a private person that is trying to use the site without 
authority from whoever it is at the church or the um, archdiocese. I, I, I don't know any of this, right? So I want to understand when you mentioned that you went on a personal tour, did you go on the personal tour with the owners of the land? No. Okay, thank you. Through the chair. Sure. Um, I'm under the impression that um, the school has a use permit, and the thing that you're raising is that they wanted to increase the number of students who could use the school. And uh, there's some discussion as to whether or not the number of people who can be there for a school, that's the thing that I think is there's some discussion going on. But there is a use permit. My understanding is it's a nonprofit, and um, it is not directly, I, I don't know what the exact nature is, but I know people who are members of the church run the school. Um, I will also just kind of share, well, we can go to discussion, but that's, that's just uh, when, when you guys are ready, but if you're, okay. when you're done with questions. I had one other clarifying question, though, which is, is there, I didn't get a direct answer, which is there are guidelines for the buffer but is there a requirement for the buffer? And I heard, I wrote down the number 15 to 30% is what's recommended. And if we take out the 52 units of low income housing um, for that particular category, the buffer would go to 7%. And the overall buffer for very, for very low and low income housing would go to 18.8%. So even if we removed it, Overall, we'd be within the buffer, is my understanding. And is, is there a legal requirement to be a buffer that's greater than 15%? Asher, do you mind chiming in on the buffer requirements? Not at all. Thank you. Um, so there is no legal requirement for the buffer in and of itself. Um, the law I mentioned, no net loss law, no net not, pardon me, no net loss law uh, is a legal requirement to have um, sufficient sites to provide Verena throughout the planning period. So if uh, that was no longer the case as a part of the planning period, uh, because other sites developed in other ways, then we would need to go back and add sites to the site inventory. Um, but if we this is. But if we come in at Sorry, if we come in at fifteen percent overall, then or eighteen point eight percent is what I did is my on the fly math. Um, mm -hmm. Please please check it. Um, then we're fine. We have enough buffer. There's no real issue there. We're within the guidelines. Correct. We're within the guidelines. What would happen um, is that so HCD gave us a series of comments that we've responded to. We've been in conversation with HCD um, over the past year. If we did remove, if we resubmitted um, a version of the housing element that did not have this site, you know, we explained that we had this conversation, we got the direction to remove the site, HCD would likely, and I, I don't want to speak you know, for them in this kind of theoretical way, and I, I understand that, but they would like, to, they would likely want to see other commitments to make up for this. Um, what those might be, again, this is very theoretical, so I don't want to imagine what they might say, but there would be some response to that, Great. I would imagine. Thank you. Mike, I have a question. So I looked at the ADU production in the past like five years and found that we're averaging around 20 ADUs and it might actually be a little more because I couldn't see the number of ADUs that were approved in the downtown area. And what I'd like to know is that in the element, we're using an average of like 12 per year. And when I looked at what we have produced in the last five years, we're at, like our average is 20 per year. So, I mean, that that's a nice difference um, between, you know, 12 and 20 per year. And, and that's actual production. Like, and I don't want to say production. Let's actual um, approval, like where we've allocated Measure D for those units. So... Is there an opportunity there to change the number of ADU units that are used in the arena calculation? 
Yeah, so a couple items in response to that. I believe the most recent year actually dipped a little bit. So I think what we saw was a, a pretty big jump when, during the pandemic when folks had family members staying at home and potentially living at home. Um, so I think we'd have to analyze that, to be honest with you. Um, I think with that dip, we do end up a little bit closer to the 12 to 13 average. I understand we had a couple pretty high years, which would push things up, right. but. but we, uh, the, in the staff, and it says that we've only uh, calculated it up to like the year 2021. I don't think we included 2022, 23, and 24. Uh, or, and I could be off a year, like don't take my, ex you know, so, but there, I looked at what we approved as a commission, it, we ratify, you know, in May, and the number was different than what's in the element. I just want you to be aware of that because that could, like that's 64 ex extra units um, that could possibly be added to our RENA, um, pr you know. Yeah, I'd have to look at the uh, specific area in the in the housing element. I'm fairly positive we looked, I believe it's three years back. Asher, can you confirm that? Yes, um, so we used 20, the commissioner's point, 2019, 2020, and 2021. Uh, again, this is HCD's, uh, I, use, I use the quotes, they use the quote, safe harbor option. Um, I, I can't speak to any of you production before then, uh, as Mike was saying, there, there's likely, wait, we, we could look into using, yeah, it fluctuates, so it's gonna be an average to kind of Right, I, and I'm, I'm talking about recent uptick in mm -hmm. ADU um, requests, because, you know, the new ADU law came into play, I think it was like 2018 or 19, I can't remember. And since then, we've seen an uptick in ADU uh, requests, mm -hmm. so anyway. It's just an opportunity, you know, we should look at what we are approving for Measure D. So the, the, I just want to reiterate the key there is most recent, so 22, 23 most likely. And I understand there's, there was a gap here between when we released back in May of 2023 and going back, we would have just been using the 2022 number. So I understand now with this delay where that could be pertinent, I understand the point. We can take a look at that. And, and 20, even in 2024, we, well, obviously you probably can't look at what, you can look at what we approved for this year and it is more than 12. I'm pretty certain it's more than 12. Yeah, we can take a look at that and then I can uh, essentially discuss further with with our uh, resident experts on, on what would be applicable for, like if there's any HCD constraints on, hey, if you don't have a certified housing element at this point, can you use production from 2023 technically? So I think that's a policy question for us to look into. Go ahead. Um, I have a follow-up um, on the agenda um, report. It, you also, um, not you, meaning the city staff, <laughs> um, also um, mentions Hilltop Mobile Home Park as a pipeline project that was of particularly notable um, project. Can you tell us more about what's going on with that project? Yeah, I don't, um, so I'm not the project planner on that project. My understanding is it's going through environmental review um, or analysis on, on that. Uh, I think the reason it's pertinent is uh, the affordability range that it would uh, potentially produce as far as the unit type is generally naturally more affordable than other types of units that would come into the city. So that is partly why it is uh, of, of pertinent interest in regards to meeting some affordability need. Okay, and then the real reason why I'm asking is this is one thing that um, um, uh, Council Member Penrose pointed out and said something to the effect that the owner is not moving fast enough, and I don't know exactly who the, which owner she's talking about. I think there's two owners that have some adjacent property, and one owner has to get some kind of easement vacated for the other, and this goes way back in history from what I'm understanding. Um, and that is the hiccup there. I, I don't know if anybody can speak to that, and how is that gonna get resolved, and how fast will this project come in? I can speak generally to 
how we approach all development in the city. Um, so myself, as well as other planners, um, I'm not a planner specifically. I, uh, my specialty is in, is in housing production and, and navigating um, those processes, but as well as affordable housing development. But uh, that being said, uh, any owner that comes into the city, we, we look for pathways on how they might be able to make their project move forward. Um, often there are financial constraints as well as uh, things they didn't expect in the development process that either slow them down or potentially derail their plans. Um, we hope not, and we're always very responsive to working with any property owner that comes to the city. Um, there's a limit to how much the city can move someone along with their development process. So I just wanted to see again, if this is a pipeline project and it's already almost through the environmental, is it safe to say within eight years this is going to definitely happen or is there some other issue here that's going to prevent it from happening and should it be moved from the pipeline to an opportunity site? I, you know, that's I don't, the question I I don't know of the details on, on that one specifically, if there's something that's, that I'm not privy to on why it would be removed from a pipeline site. But. Okay, I'm, I'm more directly involved in that project, and, and I would say to answer your question within eight years, I believe that the, the uh, owner absolutely expects that project to be fully developed in a much shorter time frame than eight years. And, and I think we have as a pipeline because it is an, an active application, and we are actively working on it at this time. Oh, so that makes it very clear, actually. If it's a pipeline project, it's got an active it's, application. Is I'm not sure correct? if that's the, that's the definition, but this project is very active. Correct, yeah, um, that, that is correct. If it has an active application, um, it's reached a certain standard in the development pipeline, we, it is in our, essentially in our pipeline. We, we include it as such. And one other question with regards to the 480 units that we have to have. Does it really have to just be units, or does, do we have to house Half Moon Bay residents in those units, or can these, or is this for statewide? I mean, because it's the statewide issue that caused, you know, the law to happen. So you know, and now if, you know, now we have an allocation, but I think it's important to understand that because we have an allocation, whether it means that allocation is for Half Moon Bay residents alone, or is it for the entire state? It's a good question. Um, you're navigating into affordable housing preferences as usually the private development um, doesn't necessarily have a mechanism to control who purchases a property. Um, there are legal studies that take place with regards to affordable housing development and invoking preferences. Um, so those are studies that the city can embark on. Um, staff has been researching them. I'm not prepared to speak on it this evening, but um, there are pathways and mechanisms, I'll say, in regards to uh, promoting uh, local residents. It could be all coast side residents as well as Half Moon Bay residents to, um, that's more typical in an affordable housing development. Um, it's not to say that you couldn't embark on a process for marketing new units to local residents, that would be another pathway. And one other question. Uh, question. Um, so let's just say these opportunity sites would um, come to fruition and we now have these opportunity sites clustered in certain areas, which I do agree with the speaker. Um, it, it does cause some kind of, you know, um, image that we're, we're clustering all the people with low income in one area and all the people with, you know, different levels of income in another area. And it has a propensity of having to look like this is a segregated community, which I don't believe that we are. Um, you know, I think we've had a rich history of everybody getting along really well and have a, having had mutual respect with everybody and we integrate a lot with each other. So I, I, I just, I'm concerned about the pocketing and, and the clustering of homes in, there, in, in certain areas. And I understand the whole issue of the downtown corridor. I get that. I, I'm not questioning that at all. It's just the image and the impression that it, it's, it's going to create. But let's just say all of this comes to fruition and 
maybe it might be before the eight years. Uh, has there been any consideration as to the population it balances between the, the voting districts in, and would that now cause us to change our voting districts in the city? And is that something that is considered with the HCD? Uh, I mean, I think HCD would have just expect the city to go through their process of, of redistricting. Um, and I know there is a process for that. I'm not an expert on it, but um, I know the city clerk's office can share details on that front. So I think it would be more of a, uh, something we acknowledge could happen, depends on how development moves forward. I think the key aspect to highlight um, uh, to Commissioner Joannis is, is regards to the state uh, enacted the affirmatively furthering fair housing and that essentially adds another lens to where development goes in the city. It really comes down to um, proximity to resources and Half Moon Bay only has resources in a select few areas. And it may optically look like we're putting all of the housing in one place. I think it, it also comes back to the, the age old debate of, of density versus urban sprawl and impacts to outlying areas and getting into environmental concerns, which that's policy um, debate uh, discussion, but um, that is the lens that, as far as the analysis that takes place, um, the city is required to be co cognizant of affirmatively furthering fair housing. I can get into more specifics there, but it's it's meant to uh, uh, decrease the amount of potential segregation that is going on, whether it was intended or unintended in a community. Yeah, it just seems like an unintended consequence is likely to occur, and, and I think we need to be cognizant of it. And you know, in the confluence of, you know, the fair housing and the confluence of, you know, the state saying that we all have to have districts, I don't think they thought through this. This is not your issue, it's just something that I, I just, you know, acknowledge for myself. It's, this possibly was not very well thought of at, at, at our state government. Sure, the only thing I'll add to that is the, the land use plan is the roadmap and the, the housing element is, is the plan for utilizing that roadmap and on where housing might be located and what is most probable in an eight year period. Um, really the, the land use plan would be most related um, in, in some regards to the redistricting. I have one more question. Sorry, I should have asked this. Uh, what, can you explain a little bit more about the cemented, the policy for affordable housing water connections? Mm -hmm. Can you explain that a little bit? Because I yeah. didn't quite understand. Um, so my understanding, and this is what was shared with me when I started working for the city of Half Moon Bay, um, I've been in public service for many years. Um, been with the city of Half Moon Bay for a couple. Now I started in 2022. Um, but that being said, what was shared with me and what I'm happy to share uh, with the group and others can correct me if I'm wrong, um, there weren't reserved allocations for water hookups prior to the land use plans um, being enacted. So uh, there's a set amount um, that uh, can the city essentially lets the water district know early on in the development process Mike, that this Mike, would be a... Would you let me do it? Please. I, it'll be I can easy. muddle through it. Sorry but. if it's okay with the chair. So um, under, um, the, under the water provisions, um, there are um, coastal priority water connections and, um, and there are also, um, and, and those coastal, that was the, originally there were just coastal priority water connections and those were for items identified in the prior LCLUP as coastal priority pick many of those, but um, agriculture being one of those, um, uh, transient transient uh, housing, basically motels, hotels, visitors serving commercial, things of that nature. Um, as part of the LCLUP, um, we worked with Coastside County Water District to basically, uh, and within the LCLUP, to create a new distinction with that, which is basically affordable housing and um, coastal um, priority. So they're, they're within the coastal priority um, category, but we broke out a portion of those as being 
also for affordable housing. So that's the distinction, affordable housing up until that point, until um, the 2020 LCLUP was not identified as a coastal priority. Coastal Commission itself, as part of their policies developed, created affordable housing as a priority, and so that's how that evolved. So we just basically provided for the opportunity for the city to designate how those allocated units within the city limits are used, and part of that could be for affordable housing and or coastal priority uses. It's helpful. Commissioner Hernandez. Just to clarify, the purpose of the housing element is to identify locations where housing can be placed and to identify opportunities for different types of housing that can be placed. But it's not setting the policy of, hey, we're going to have 100% affordable housing in this location or that location. It's not the implementation of the plan. It's the identification of the opportunity. I just want to make sure we address Ms. D'Souza's um, comment from earlier. And, and, and I think that's what I've heard. And I'm seeing the head nod there. Yeah, I, the city acknowledges that there's, you know, it's, it's up to the owner specifically of that parcel on how they develop. And my understanding is in the housing element we have, or in the um, LCLUP, we have policies about creating mixed types of housing within the community. So there's already policies in place to help safeguard, but it's our responsibility to make sure we actually execute that. Thanks. Uh, you make it clear. Um, and the, the concern is, uh, um, is that, you know, so what this sounds like, it's a housing element that we're trying to fill a condition that HCD has set for us. And it just seems very, um, oh, it, it, it just doesn't seem like it's real, right? We're gonna, we're gonna throw things at, 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 a, at, a, at a problem so that we can get, just get the check off. I mean, and that's what it sounds like to me. I mean, I'm not, if that's the strategy, that's the strategy. We just have to make it work. Should we move to discussion? I have one more question. Um, I wanted to know um, why we didn't uh, explore a, a hotel conversion in the plan, and, and specifically for, as for an emergency uh, shelter. I just want to make sure I'm understanding the question. So a conversion from a temporary or non-permanent to permanent housing site or? Uh, no, uh, of, of a hotel to potentially um, a shelter. Um, it's a good question. I'd have to refresh on if we're required to identify. I know there's some parameters. Maybe Asher can help me out on, on shelter. I know there was, there was language, and I'm going back a ways. Um, to when I last discussed this with, with internally, but um, Asher, is there requirements in regards to shelter? I thought there was maybe a program area that touches on this, but I know it's not part of the RENA account necessarily. Can you provide some Correct. detail? Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm trying to pull up the program, but uh, um, the housing was not required to identify a particular method for providing a shelter or a particular, you know, parcel, part of land, it's uh, the housing has to identify a uh, particular zoning district, um, land use designation that a uh, shelter could be developed by right in. And um, that could include, um, depending on the zoning, um, sorry, I was trying to pull it up and respond to your question at the same time. But um, it could include a hotel conversion. Um, it could also include other potential ways. Again, this is approached in a variety of different ways in San Mateo County. Um, but our approach was not to be programmatic about it, but to say, you know, we can meet the state requirement and allow for a British shelter development as fits what landowners, what makes sense for landowners and is safe for um, potential residents. Thank you. Do we have any more clarifying questions from the commission? No? Okay, uh, Commissioner Gorn, did you wanna start with your no. deliberations? 
Um, thank you. Um, so I guess the in, in terms of the, the, the church site seems to be uh, an important um, decision point here. Um, I did hear Asher kind of hint that state legislation may be pending to uh, push religious organizations to develop low-income housing. Um, but, and so I could see that that would um, scare the church a little. Um, but I would say that I think also the city would be sort of derelict if it didn't include that site as a potential site since this is, it's a potential site. That's what this list is, is a potential site. So I don't really see um, anything wrong with it. It can change over time um, in both directions. So they can get more steadfast in their, you know, they move forward their plans for the school. Um, and I think that's totally fine. It doesn't go against this um, housing element at all. Um, so that said, I did have one other thing I wanted to raise that I wasn't going to raise, but this, the Coast House, um, we don't want to convert it to permanent housing, <laughs> and I know that, but since what we're talking about here is potential housing, shouldn't it be included in this, um, in this list of potential housing, of potential long-term housing. It seems like that's not something I necessarily want to do, but it seems like it fits along the same line as the church. Through the chair, if you'd like me to, okay. Um, so I think that's a very pertinent point. Um, I think as it stands now, the Coast House is serving a certain purpose um, without other temporary housing sites. So I think that was the main reason for not including it, as well as uh, we haven't heard from, I believe it's technically the county who owns the property. We haven't seen an indication to convert it during this cycle. It's not to say that it isn't of interest in the future. Um, so it could well, be something to about. bank toward a future cycle as another consideration. Well, we're listed as a potential. Right, I, as a potential site, but I don't know if we want to do that because if we list it as a potential site, are we opening it to permanent housing that we don't want? So I don't know the answer to that. So just raising the point. Okay, uh, Commissioner Ruddick. Uh, regarding the <clears throat> the church's property, I agree completely with Commissioner Gorn. I think the city would be remiss to not identify it as a as an interesting opportunity no pressure whatsoever on the any property owner to do one thing or the other and and if and when uh, alternative development happens there then then take it off the opportunity list but for the meantime I think it certainly belongs uh, listed there and the city would have done good due diligence to to include it as part of that list So I uh, also agree with Commissioners Ruddick and Gorn on the point of the church. Um, I've also um, heard comments from representative of the school project um, who have expressed interest in potentially doing a land swap. So I know the city's interested in, in pursuing things. So I think it's pretty reasonable that even though at the moment the pastor and the archdiocese have said this is not what we're planning to do things change laws change the city could bring something to the table that makes it interesting for the church to take a different path so I think it's perfectly reasonable I think my understanding with the um, going back to the question uh, Commissioner Gorn that you didn't want to ask <laughs> that you did is that we're looking for vacant sites that are undeveloped is the primary thing, or project sites where the owner has come forward and said, I wanna do something here. There are exceptions to that, but I think that's generally, and I'm looking to Mike to, when you look at project sites. Sorry, I was writing a note and then looked up 
probably halfway through, so I apologize for making you repeat well, that. I, I, think, I think the general thing is we're looking for undeveloped sites or sites where a project owner has come forth and said, we want to do something different here. That's, that's, that's kind of why I don't think in a normal course of things we wouldn't include the Coast Side Hotel, um, which I think I'm fine with anyway, <laughs> to, to your point. Um, but uh, I, I look, this is a informational document that we're obligated to provide. City staff have invested a tremendous amount of time in this. Um, I think what we have conforms with what's required. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure we're going to hit our target. Maybe we're going to exceed it. This doesn't take into account the impact of super density bonus law, which could potentially have us overperform on this. But directionally, this seems fine. It seems far superior to what we did eight years ago. So, you know, I, I think I'm perfectly comfortable moving forward with this as is. Vice Chair Joannis. Um, a couple other things that I wanted to see if, um, were considered, uh, such as travel trailers. I've noticed that uh, several houses, you know, along the coast have travel trailers and several of them that are being used as units for people to live in. I, I didn't know if um, that's counted towards the housing. I, I, I guess it has to be a fixed site. Is that what you're saying? Okay. And, and same thing with tiny homes it has to be fixed because they're movable too, right? Yeah. I, just to answer that quickly is uh, it would, an ADU is what would be counted. So it would have to be a permitted ADU to be counted in the, in the arena allocation. Okay or to be, yeah, counted as part of our arena. So a, a travel trailer does not count. Even though we're housing people, people well, are being housed in it. If, technically, if it's an unpermitted dwelling unit, that okay. potentially gets, that gets into a, a longer discussion about okay, the need for affordable to. housing and if you're evicting those individuals, where do they go and dis potential displacement. So there's... There's a balance in code enforcement as well as... Right, right. Understood. So I'll, I'll leave it I, at that. That's, that's what I just didn't know if we were able to count those or not. Um, but um, going back, I, I understand the entire discussion of the church and having it as, you know, listed in because this is supposed to meet the criteria necessary. It just feels that we're listing sites. It's not only the church sites, but many other sites that, the, you know, it looks like... You know, the city looked at a map and said, this is an open site, this is an open site. They met the letter of the law. That's all they did. And I think that's the, you know, and, and looked at the environmental constraints, whatever it was that they said, these vacant lands work and these vacant lands don't work. And, um, and they put that on the list. I, I, I understand this. I, I work in state government. I work in federal government. I know how to check boxes. I know exactly what's necessary. Um, and so I think that message needs to go out to the owners to let them know, hey, look, we have to include it, to, include it on there. It's not going to take away your rights, even though there's some state law coming up. These folks would have to deal with it at that point in time. I think that needs to be brought out to these property owners. So um, I understand all of that. Um, in reading the report, there are several comments that I, I, I did make on each um, of 36 comments. And what, rather than discussing it here, I'll send that, those notes to you um, so that they can be part of the uh, formal um, um, response to, as a private citizen I, and not as a commissioner. But a couple of things that I noticed, on page A11 of the... Um, introduction, I just had a little bit of concern because it, it did point out, um, let's see, A11, here we go, let me go, I just, when I read that, it just didn't make me feel very good, um, and it, 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 it seemed like it, the language that they mean I need to be re rewritten, I think it's A11, where they, is it A11? Um, I'm, I'm seeing extremely low-income households Let's see. on A11 as the only edit that was made on that page. Okay, hold on a second. There, there's a section in here that talks about 
a gated community ocean colony and a place and, and um, properties west of the highway and properties north of the city have been, does, have been known to be um, affluent areas. And it, it just, the way it's written makes it sound um, disparaging to those communities. So it's just, maybe just reword some of these things so it doesn't make, pit, a pit um, certain neighborhoods against other neighborhoods or people with affluence, if they, do, if they are affluent, because it just seems like it's a very subjective comment because we don't know how affluent people really are in these neighborhoods, right? So it just seemed that maybe restructuring the language in there would be helpful. If I may, um, through the chair, um, my understanding um, on the point you're bringing up in regards to that, Commissioner Joannis, is um, the city was required to do analysis um, regarding maps that we don't control necessarily. Um, Asher might be able to provide some more detail. I believe they're TCAC maps, if I'm not mistaken, of concentrated areas of affluence. So it's not something that the city identifies. It's just an analysis that we're required to perform. Um, I, Asher, if you, I, I can, through the chair, if you'd like Asher to provide more detail, I'm happy to pass it over to him. If, if I worked for helpful. a company that used to make the maps. It's a technical term. Okay. It, it, so, it, so, um, so then perhaps we can cite where this information was. It, it, it sounded like it was a subjective you know, opinion. Maybe if we can cite where that data was re extracted it? from. I, I didn't see it there. Maybe, maybe I missed it. But if we can s cite exactly why we're making the statement with you know, the, 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 um, the original source, that would be m very helpful. Across the entire document, if you could just do that. Could you clarify the page number again? Because on, okay, I don't, I don't think it's A11. Is it intro 11? Um, intro 11, sorry. Intro, perhaps intro 11. Um, I'm sorry about that. I'm not, I don't yeah, see it's intro 11. There. It's at the, it's, um, I think the, it's within the second paragraph. The, and I didn't see a citation in, in, in there. So um, I, I was thinking, it just made me feel like, why are we, Pointing this out, and, and I understand you're supposed to delineate, you know, where the areas of, you know, different, you um, know, strata of population, but it just felt uneasy when I read it. <laughs> cover just the um, so Mike were you asking us to make a decision about what to do to whether to leave the church in or I mean I, it seems like we sort of have consensus to leave the church in I think that I think the guidance that the Planning Commission yeah, is giving with, you. with confirmation to all the home to the uh, um, owners of the property the the exact rationale as to why we're doing this, and it's to meet the letter of the law. It's not committing them to anything. I think this whole new law that potentially is coming up um, that Asher mentioned, I don't know what, that's, what it is, but it might have been scaring a lot of the property owners. Um, and I, I can, can confirm I've, uh, I emailed the church on Monday, yesterday. Um, provided the language that was in the staff report to provide a heads up that we'd be discussing that this evening. Um, so I, we can take that. Um, I, you know, the pipeline sites, I just want to clarify. So the pipeline sites are in the development process. They're aware of, because they're moving forward. The ADU sites are probable ADU development, so we don't have a, a list of potential there. Really, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, Commissioner Joannis, it's really just the opportunity sites that we're referring to. Um, so reaching out to those individuals um, is doable from a staff perspective, if that's. Um, through the chair. Go ahead. Can I, I just wanted to add uh, one more thing, because um, I know the um, staff has asked us for input um, and 
Um, I know this is an advisory, doc, you know, this is like just a summary of what is out there in terms of the housing. But um, one thing that's not mentioned in here is uh, home sharing and co-housing and encouraging um, and encouraging that, which I think is um, sort of a good path to affordable housing. Um, and so I don't know if that is can be included as part of the housing element or not, but I would just suggest if it can be, I would um, encourage staff to do that. Thanks. If, if I may, through the chair, I believe we um, have a program. I was going to try to look for it, but I, I believe there is something that speaks to home sharing in one of our program areas. I don't have the exact number up in front of me. I could look it up, but I believe we should have something in the in the program areas. So it'd be the um, housing plan, and I can confirm that. Through, yeah, it's not sorry, a, through the chair. It's, no, it's program not, three dash three. Yeah, it's not a directive. I'm just <laughs> raising I, it. It's like it seems like an important part of a housing element. Thanks. Um, and then also th throughout the document, um, I noticed that it says Half Moon Bay versus in the city, the city of Half Moon, which implies to me, are we talking about the Half Moon Bay coast side? Are we talking about the city of Half Moon Bay? Because it seems like a lot of the data that came through is ca coming from the county data. And I didn't know if we had any specific data for the city of Half Moon Bay. It just seemed very confusing to me whether we're talking about the city or we're representing the entire coast side and does HCD know the difference? If I, so um, I know we have some maps in the housing element that outline the city boundaries clearly. Um, the development pipeline uh, maps all are just within the city of Half Moon Bay um, specifically. I, it's a general understanding between HCD and, and the city that we have no jurisdiction beyond our borders. So the data that's in here is specific on, on all the all, all the all the maps and the uh, charts are specific to Half Moon Bay that were extracted from county data, correct? Because it seemed very uh, generic, and the reason why I say this is just so that you know is I compared others uh, other. Um, elements that were approved specifically San Mateo County, uh, San Mateo, and then other elements that um, were in the process of being reviewed and the comments that HCD gave to them and the comments HCD gave to us just to see the flavor of all of this. And it seems to me that the, that the data seemed to look the same. And, and maybe it was just me getting tired reading all these elements and then reading our elements and trying to figure out which one's which. I just want to make sure everything that we're using in our, in our element is, is city specific and is not representing county data. Is that correct? I, I mean, there's aspects of the housing element that look at a regional perspective. Um, however, like the housing needs assessment is specific to Half Moon Bay, but that the study that went on to grasp all of the areas of the housing needs assessment was done through a regional effort through 21 elements. So it was the same uh, organization that was contracted uh, by all jurisdictions to, to perform that work. So that's why there is some, uh, I, the slide that I, I think it's one of my first slides, um, what I was trying to get at, and maybe I didn't put it as eloquently as possible, is um, there's a lot of overlap in regards to how a city must produce their housing elements. So there are going to be similarities. There's, there's some differences in how cities uh, produce their housing element. But uh, the other thing I'll confirm is the state has various reviewers. So as far as the comments that cities receive, there's different reviewers at HCD. Um, and it's probably just unfeasible for them to all align with one another. Um, it's just different individuals that are performing reviews. Um, they generally keep a reviewer to a certain region, so uh, comments that we receive might be similar if we had the same review, reviewer as Pacifica. Reviewers change. They go, the state goes through staff turnover just like everyone else, so um, I just wanted to provide that detail as well. I know the revolving do door at the state and federal level, and, and that's why I'm asking this, is this to make sure that they understand 
that you know, no matter which reviewer you get this month, or what, it, the timing is everything, because a reviewer that you're talking to today is not going to be the same reviewer that's going to get this you know, six months from now, three months from now. So I, I just want to make sure that when we look at this document, they know this is city specific, because when I was reading through it, it that occurred to me as, what, am I reading a county? Um, you know, number, or am I reading a city-specific number? So citations as to where the source information is, I think would be very helpful, especially when it's city-specific data. I understand we're comparing it to the county areas and everything else, but I think it's important. And, and I only say that because I'm a reader and a lot of other stuff. So, sure, um, Under, understood. And um, yeah, I think a, a perfect example, not that there other, aren't other examples throughout the housing element, is the housing needs assessment, which a lot of that data points that that consultant was hired to perform is pulled from census data um, and then is granular scope is to then refine it to half moon bay specific on our census blocks Through the chair. so just to summarize where we're at um, we have to produce 480 units of housing over the next oh, in the course of this cycle um, we have a 63 percent buffer that we've already identified and if the city implements or takes note of projects around home sharing, additional ADUs, application of density bonus law, super density bonus law, and even the conversion of the coastside hotel, as long as the city tracks those projects, that will also burn down our obligation during this housing cycle, depending on which categories these things fit into. So there's more opportunity than what's just in this document. Yes, there could be sites not identified in the housing element, if I'm understanding the, the point there, that could come yes. forth to the city that weren't previously identified. And we're going to try to do a best effort to keep track of all those things so we can hit our goals. Of course. Great. I, from my perspective, I'm, I don't have any other comments or questions. I, I just have uh, one other um, comment to make is about Measure D. I, I think in your staff report you said you, you guys are going to rewrite the Measure D part of the report, is that correct? Uh, it, it, it was more so just an acknowledgement that uh, I believe there was a, a city council meeting and then the release of this staff report were far too close together okay. for staff to make, Be to even comment on what, uh, I think we, we did our best to allude to where, where things would go, but um, there's some updates that are likely gonna be needed to just I think we were leaning into a potential ballot measure in some of the language that'll likely need to be updated. It, it was more of an acknowledgement that there's some additional revision that's gonna need to take place there. But it would only reflect what has been directed to staff. Okay, so we would need to let you know that there's places in the um, housing element as it stands right now that actually talks about the measure D that is going to the ballot that needs to be corrected. Because there's, there's several places in the um, text um, that actually refer to Measure D and it being um, considered by the city council and that it gave several um, discussion of topics in there, it's not topics, it had seven areas where they discussed that if, if, if the measure doesn't go to the ballot this November, it'll, it's going to go to the ballot next year or something like that. I think 2026. 2026. So I don't know if that's going to be fixed in here. Yeah, I think, I think it's just an acknowledgement um, of what has taken place during, I mean, theoretically we would have been certified by the time most of this was going on. It was put in place. So these programs were identified before. So we're, we're now getting to a point where we're overlapping with current events on programs that were put in place when we first started drafting the housing element in its first release. I understand, so will so, that be repaired now? I mean, I correct. Just, yeah. okay. Great. Yeah, Thank um, you. acknowledging that it is an eight year cycle, so we'll just be cognizant that the city can under direction of the city council can choose to do what they would like to on that front. I think what our direction from city council and, and what we've put alluded to in the staff report and I mentioned in uh, my presentation this evening is that 
I believe staff was directed to investigate the administrative path. We're not, right. we, I know there's clear direction that we're not moving forward with the ballot measure. Okay. We just wanna make sure language to HCD is reflecting that. Right. So it's really just administrative revisions at that point, not anything that we were asking for additional feedback. We're, we're clear on that. Okay, thank you. All right, um, with that, I think we could maybe uh, move on to, our, is everyone done discussing the housing element? Yes. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for uh, um, doing a nice job tonight. Absolutely. Giving us all this information. And um, Asher out there. Happy to. Thank you. So is there then, any further action you that you require us for this? It, if there was consensus and you wanted to make a formal recommendation, um, to the city council, you're welcome to do so. I think we have notes so we can put things together, but if there's <clears throat> a formal, um, uh, excuse me, through, yeah. I'll, so I'll, so um, I was just wondering, after this, it's going to go directly to the city council uh, August 7th. Is there gonna be any socializing of this maybe in another public setting meeting, not with commission, but just introducing it to neighborhoods or to, you know, I didn't know because I think I, I I thought that this was going to be socialized one more time um, to the public, other than in a, a setting where there's a commission setting. I thought there might have been a study session involved. I don't. I, uh, I, that's what I, mean, I thought. I'm just asking. Uh, I mean, I would say the the robust community engagement process. Um, was, was embarked on prior to the release of the first draft. Um, not that we haven't had public meetings, so the, and the public is you know, continually welcome to provide comments on, on the housing element. It is a public document, it's on our website. Um, as far as a, a public meeting, there won't be any between now, or at least staff hadn't planned on any between now and, and city council. The city council meeting would be the next public meeting that Everyone is welcome to, to attend, provide feedback. Um, so that would essentially be the, you know, the public comment, I mean, is a um, opportunity for the public to provide feedback. So that, that was our plan. So through the chair, the, um, there was no uh, resolution in the staff report. Um, and I'm happy to uh, pass it on to city council and recommend that they um, adopt this, but I, is that something that would take a vote? That's my question. I, I guess we, um, that would be, I think we should do I, that. Yeah, I could yeah. provide a little clarification, if I may, through the chair. Um, so the recommendation that staff is, is looking for is uh, just that the, the city council, um, you know, if there, if there were any items, which I think were um, overall consensus on uh, support for the document as, as it is, is um, is just that um, it's not necessarily a uh, we're not asking city council to adopt but we are uh, it's a recommendation for city council to submit the revised housing element to HCD that is the intended action I'm welcome to friendly revisions from the other side of the table here yeah I mean I think the way it's stated on the agenda is just a recommendation to consider the comments that you all have made tonight um, and I think that would probably be sufficient unless um, I think what maybe Mike's pointing to with the reference to consensus is if anyone feels like any of these comments that there isn't consensus, you know, maybe you would discuss it. But otherwise, I think it would probably just be sufficient to make a motion to direct staff to take your comments to the city council. Okay. I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion that um, the Planning Commission has received the housing element and we recommend that the City Council adopt the housing element with the comments that have been heard here today and uh, with consideration of the comments that have been heard here today as well as the comments that have been received by Planning Commissioners in writing. Um, Yep. All right, then I'll second it. <laughs> okay, um, Joe, will you do a roll call? Yes. Okay. So we have a, a motion, and we'll go ahead and do a roll call, uh, roll call here. Uh, Commissioner Ruddick? Yes. Commissioner Hernandez? Yes. Commissioner Gorn? 
Yes, please. Uh, Vice Chair Joannis? Yes. And uh, Chair Gossett? Yes. Okay. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you now we'll have a director's report. Thank you, Chair Gossett, members of the commission, Steve McHarris, Interim Community Development Director. I have just uh, one update just for your next meeting, which is in three weeks. We have that extended month. So three weeks from now, which will be August 13th, um, item for the Planning Commission will be the Hyatt Hotel project. And I just wanted to give you just quickly, it's 102 rooms, 66,260 square feet. It's uh, two, 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 primarily two buildings. There's one additional third small building on the site. It also includes four residential lots along Seymour. You may recall the project from a couple years ago in work sessions, so that will be coming forward. On the 13th, we will, we, the last update on the city's website shows the alternative, um, I think it was alternative two, and there is a revised alternative two that's described in the project that's going to be before you, so somewhat smaller, somewhat revised based on comments received from the community and uh, various city bodies. The city's website is um, at City Half Moon Bay, the community development page of the website. It's under current planning, planning projects, and you'll see a site dedicated to the Hyatt Hotel. We'll be updating that as we get closer, probably in the next, I'd say in the next week, you're gonna see updates on that. And then you'll see a, a complete staff report and a final environmental impact report that goes along with that. That'll be posted, I'm not sure exactly which days, but that'll be out soon before your meeting, and in that, the final EIR is comprised of the response to comments to the draft EIR. So it's the entire draft document that the community has seen has been out there for a long time with all the, I think, 90 comment letters in response to all of those comments, comment letters, which again, provide, which will then uh, become the final EIR for the record. So that's all I have to report tonight. Thank you. Uh, any uh, commissioner um, reports? I don't have a report, but I wanted to follow up on uh, whether or not your question on the landfill uh, was ever answered. Yeah, I was that myself, so. yeah um, that's the county uh, closed landfill over there uh, at the end of Poplar and uh, Seymour. Seymour. Yes, I was wondering uh, what the status is of that. Yes, yeah, Steve uh, and and John, if you're involved, I, I had asked a couple meetings ago if we might at some point have an update on what the county is doing, if anything, regarding the, the work we permitted them to, to do south of that parking lot. I was out on a walk the other morning and pondering the same thing. Um, so I think there's um, two things there. One is um, I'm not sure where we are with the receipt of the report and documentation for what they discovered. Obviously, they did repair work on the revetment wall there and uh, stabilized, we assume, the work, but that um, also, were, they were to share with that document. So we will follow up with County Public Works. I think the other piece of that is appropriate, which is that we did an emergency CDP. Obviously, there is um, typically um, required a follow-up to that, and the question for the county is, are there additional follow-ups that are necessary to deal with that, or um, do we all consider the revetment work and um, that, that emergency work to constitute also the permanent um, final work with that? So we owe you back a response. I'll, I'll take the heat off of Steve on that one and follow up with, because um, I started with the ECDP <laughs> working on that one um, a little bit. So agreed and agreed. Thank you, John. I do have a follow-up because there was something else that was brought up um, over a year ago where the cap was kind of removed and you can see some of, because it's not a subtitle D landfill. It's, it's, um, it's a very old landfill, but it looks like during the storms, some, I, I don't know which entity, drug um, trees across and it scraped off the first layer and you can actually look in and you can see the the the, the trash that was compact in the, that's compacted in there and now I'm seeing more coming out of there so I was just wondering if you could follow up on that as well absolutely 
I do have one other planning commission or comment. Uh, August 28th is the 10 year anniversary of the day that Obama wore a tan suit. So I hope you wear that same suit on August 28th. Mike, remind me. Oh, oh yes. I love oh. this suit. Yes. <laughs> I do too. If I only had a seersucker, it would be a perfect no, match to that point. I don't own a seersucker. Oh, I have one other report to make. Um, the Coastal Commission had a, a, a learning session or session on uh, the housing, um, the fair housing. Um, I attended. It was quite interesting. Um, there was several, uh, it was a Zoom. We had to register, and um, Chair uh, Person Gossett, Ch Chair Gossett was on it, and it, it, I, they heard a lot from the city of Half Moon Bay. <laughs> <laughs> and how, and and our and our housing uh, issues. So, um, it, I think is it on tape? Maybe you can. I don't know if they recorded the meeting, but um, I, I don't believe they did. Uh, they didn't say they were going to. But there were a lot of other coastal cities there, especially Santa Barbara, Carpinteria, um, Pacifica. Pacifica was on. Um, they all have a lot of concerns as to how HCD. And the state is um, kind of, but, but actually targeting the coastal communities because they believe we are clusters of affluence. Okay, uh, with that, does anyone want to make a motion to adjourn? I would like to make a motion to adjourn our meeting with our cluster of mixed communities yes. for the Planning Commission meeting. I will second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.